Uh, but uh, John 15, verse number 1, this is the Lord Jesus speaking. This is uh, the seventh of, of the statements in, in the Gospel of John where Jesus says, I am, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. Uh, I am, uh, he, he goes on and on. But the, the reason that's significant is because there's a, a particular place in the Old Testament that some of you will recall that when Moses talked to the Lord from the burning bush, whenever he said, uh, who shall I say sent me? And he said, tell, then God spoke and said, tell them that I am, that I am, I am, that I am sent thee. And so when Jesus says, I am, it's more than just saying, I am. There's a, there's a connection. There's a greater meaning in behind it. I believe that's illustrated in John, uh, I believe it's John 3 toward the end of the chapter where uh, Jesus uh, answered the uh, Pharisees and he said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Let that sink in for a little bit. And of course they wanted to kill him for saying that. Uh, but anyway, uh, John 15 verse 1, Jesus speaking says, I am. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that, it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me." I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye, if ye abide in me, my words abide in you. And ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I think it's great that the Lord's concerned about our joy. Notice verse number 12, This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. And we're going to stop reading right there for sake of time. Uh, let's once again go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, I pray you will illuminate these verses. I'm glad that you uh, inspired these verses. I'm glad that you preserved these verses, God, so that we could indeed have the Word of God before us today. But Lord, I pray that you'll illuminate these verses, God, in our hearts and minds. I pray that you'll help me to uh, preach, God, with your touch, with your uh, unction. I pray that if there's anybody here that's not saved, how I pray that you'll uh, show them their need for you, that they are not connected uh, to you, Lord, and that they can can be today and they should be today and for those that are saved God that are in you God I pray that they will um, uh, realize the importance of cultivating that relationship Lord so we'll thank you for all that you do Lord for it's in Jesus name we pray Amen. Well, I want to preach a little bit, a little bit this morning about abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. If you go through this chapter, you can figure out very quickly that abiding is the theme of this chapter. In fact, uh, the word abide is used about 12 times in John 15. Um, and I want to preface that a little bit actually by saying this, the Greek word that that abide comes from is used uh, 12 times in this text. I want to say something else, uh, let you know about the word abide and, or meno uh, in just a moment, but it's interesting, that word meno, the Greek word, is, it's translated 71 different times in the New Testament. It's interesting that 12 of those 71 times are found right here in John 15, 11 of those times are found in 1 John chapter 2. 
For, so for those of you that enjoy studying your Bible, I would encourage you to go read 1 John chapter 2 in correlation with John chapter number 15. And uh, consider these things. And I'll, I'll, I'll say further that uh, this is a little bit of a continuation of our message on uh, Wednesday night. But uh, the Lord's just been kind of directing my heart this way since last Sunday. But here's what that word means. It means, uh, the word meno, which is used, translated abide, oftentimes, it means to stay. It means to continue. Continue. So sometimes you'll read the word continue, and it's the same word, but it means to stay, to abide, to continue, to dwell. To dwell, to endure. To endure. To be present. To remain. And that's another way that it's often translated to remain, to stand. Think about that. So abiding in Christ means standing in Christ, taking our stand uh, in our standing, if you will. And then also, uh, and lastly, it means to tarry, to tarry. And so when it's talking about abiding in Christ, think about that. He says there in verse 4, abide in me. And so without any harm whatsoever, we could translate that as saying, Jesus saying, stay in me, continue in me, dwell in me, endure in me, be present, remain, stand, tarry. In other words, what we see, I believe, is the true strength of the Christian life, the true source of the Christian life. What does it really mean, anyway, to be a Christian? Now, it depends on who, uh, who you ask that question to. For a lot of people, they feel like you're a Christian. Th that just by simply believing in God, you're a Christian. And by America's uh, definition, that is often the case. But the, the actual meaning of the word Christian, the word means to be Christ-like which I would argue that very few of us are, uh, but still the idea is the way that we're Christ-like, uh, so what it really means to be a Christian is to abide in Christ. Abiding in Christ, number one, means knowing Christ. This whole, this whole message, folks, starts with the idea of an intimate relationship with Christ. No, we, we speak oftentimes about knowing Christ, knowing God, knowing Him as your Savior. There is a vast difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. And I think each of us, if you're here today and you know Christ as your Savior, you can remember a time when you did not know Christ as your Savior. You knew of Him, but you did not know Him. But I am so glad for the day that I met Him. And you say, did you, did you personally meet Him? Well, I didn't physically meet Him, but yes, I think you could say I personally met Him because when I learned the truth of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God reveals His truth, we have the wonderful and glorious opportunity to accept Christ as our Savior these passages, this message from the Lord Jesus Christ speak of a relationship. Amen. Not simply of religion. And, and, and I know sometimes we could parse the terms there. I understand to a certain extent I would be identified as religious. The Bible says in one place, if any, be, seem religious among you. So it's not a, a bad word, honestly, to use to identify ourselves. But for the distinction of it, uh, true Christianity is about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about religion. It's not about do this, do that, the other thing, belong to this church, follow these rules, and, and so forth, and then all of a sudden that makes you a Christian. No, it's about trusting Christ. It's about knowing Him. In other words, true Christianity is this. It is the fact that Jesus Christ came down to man. And it's the fact that Jesus still comes to man, and He still offers a personal relationship. The Bible says, with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what the Bible is telling us is that we can have a personal relationship, so that's God coming to man. What does religion do? Religion says, here's how you get to God. But the Bible teaches about how God came to man. Amen. Oftentimes religious tradition says, here's how you get to God. But hallelujah, I am so glad that the truth of the matter is that this is God coming to man. Amen. Because I want to let you in on something. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Which in turn tells us that any efforts that we're making on our own 
Jesus said there, without me you can do nothing. It's not about the, the progress. that It's not about what we can do, thank God. But it's about what He's done already. And then after He does a work in our hearts, then we begin to do works for Him. We do works. We, you could argue that we could sometimes live by certain rules, but I am not counting on those rules to get me to heaven. I am not trying to preach today. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be a Christian today so that maybe I'll have a better chance at getting to heaven. No, sir. I did not get baptized at hoping that maybe that'll help me give me a better chance to get to heaven. No, I trusted Christ. I was forgiven. I became a child of God. My, my ticket to heaven was punched the moment that I trusted Christ as my Savior and everything else is just a result of that. Amen. But what happens is religion gets the cart before the horse and they say, you have to do all these things. But that's not what Jesus is saying. We can abide. So what does it really mean to be a Christian? What does it really mean to, to live the Christian life? Because I'll say this, the biggest problem with most people that we know is that they've been taught all these religious principles all their life. They know about Christ. They know about God. They know about Christmas. They know about Easter. I mean, you know, we're, we're in, in the midst of Lent right now. But how many really know Him? How many are depending solely on what Jesus did versus depending on their church or their baptism or what they can do? I'm so glad today that I'm trusting in Christ. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad that's the way it ought to be. But I'll say this. There's many Christians, many of us, that don't get the idea of what it means to abide in Christ. And so hopefully I can share this with you. And I'll not get through everything that this passage has to say today because... Uh, when, when Jesus spoke these words, one of the things that we know is that He was speaking about something that the people in that day could relate to. And I'm glad Jesus does that. He speaks about things. And another thing I want to say about that is this too. Some people say, well, don't the Bible say this? Do you know that some people confuse what tradition says and what some man said years ago with what the Bible says? But the Bible teaches us about Christ and and when Jesus spoke, He tried to make things simple, is my point. He tried to make things understandable. Uh, and here's what He said. He said, you are, I, am the vine, I am the vine, you are the branches. He was speaking about something that they understood. So here's the thing. So in order to live life, you have to have some sort of connection. If we're going to live a, a life for the Lord, we've got to have a connection to Christ. We have to have a connection to Christ. Here's the question, what is your source of living? That's an important question because that depends on the way you live your life. What is your source? Where are you plugged into? See, if we're saved, we're automatically connected with Christ. But is that what, who we're allowing to supply our source? Or are we kind of all jumbled up and not, not, uh, not, not allowing Christ to do a work in our life? Where do you draw your power for living from? i tell you why some of us get so wore out sometimes, spiritually speaking, is because we are not trusting in the power of Christ. We're trying to do everything by our own energy, through our own wisdom and our own efforts and so forth. But man, what does a vine do? What does a branch on a vine do? Just stays there. It just stays connected. It just draws on the source. And so where are you connected what is the source? Because what we're going to find out in a moment, I'm not going to go into it too much, but one of the prophetic vines that the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation is the vine that's connected to this world. And I don't mean this earth, but I mean the system of this world. The, the rebellion against God, the rebellion against the things and the ways of God. The Bible talks about how that that fruit is going to be fully ripe one day. And another term for fully ripe is to say rotten. Rotten. Rotten fruit. It's connected to this world and that vine's going to be cut down in the book of Revelation in a prophetic sense. There's another prophetic application. That's Revelation 14. There's another prophetic application in the sense that God called Israel the vine in another place. So there's that prophetic. He took them and He planted them in Canaan's land. But one of the things I'm going to, one of the themes and one of the principles about a vine being planted is that that vine produces grapes. That vine produces fruit. Why does the vine produce fruit? For someone else to enjoy. To be a blessing to someone else. And folks, that's really one of the keys to the Christian life. Um, oftentimes, 
We, we read this chapter and it's kind of funny because we can actually do a little bit of harm to the text if we only apply this personally. We need to apply this personally, but we've got to understand that there's a prophetic interpretation in these verses. We've got to understand when Jesus said, I'm the true vine, what he's saying is, as in comparison to these other vines, I'm the true vine. Uh, and there is a, a practical application in the sense that this involves the church. So it's a little bit ironic when sometimes we read the Bible, and if we're not careful, it's always just about me. There is a lot for me, praise God, in the Word of God, but, when it, but, but the idea is God blesses me. I grow to try to be a blessing to someone else. To try to, so that's one of the principles that we'll, uh, we'll perhaps see uh, repeated uh, here in the Bible or it, it, and throughout this text. But as we consider this, here's one of the great things about the vine. The vine speaks of our union with Christ. And here's the thing. A branch being connected with the, with the vine, there's a living union. There's a living union. So that we may bear fruit. But there's also a loving union. Man, Jesus said, I don't call you my servants, I call you my friends. I call you my friends. There's a loving union so that we may enjoy Him. And then there's a lasting union. In other words, we are connected with Him He's not breaking us off. We're connected. So the branch of itself is weak and useless. The Bible says there in uh, verse number uh, uh, verse number six, how that if a man that if a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch and is withered. And that's where, by the way, we see some of the prophetic and practical implications of this. But have you thought about that? If you break a vine, or if you break a, a, a branch off of a vine. What can you do with that? Very little. I mean, it literally is about good for nothing. I mean, it, it can, it, and that's what it can literally be burned. And if you know me, I, I, I love to burn stuff. I forgot to cover my fire pit that's in the ground. And so right now, uh, Evan suggested taking a polar plunge in it. So it's kind of a bad situation. I swore I wasn't going to let that happen this year, so my burning is going to be put off for a little bit. But, uh, but, but you burn. You, you, you don't build with a, with a piece of grapevine. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's nothing if it's not connected. It's useless. It, it doesn't draw fruit. It, you can't build with it. You can't prop nothing up with it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's virtually useless. But see, the, 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 the picture that God gives us is this. Abiding in Christ means that we can then abound in Christ. It is one thing, and this goes into our message of, that we've been looking at on Wednesday night, because it's through the power of the Holy Spirit of God that dwells within us it's, that, that enables us to produce fruit, be a fruitful vine. Now, it's one thing to overcome the flesh and not do evil. But it's quite something else to do good things. We've been studying about legalism on Wednesday nights. A legalist is able to boast that he's not guilty of adultery or murder or a number of other things that he does not do. But, anyone, but, but can anyone see the beautiful graces of the Spirit of God in his life? In other words, for a lot of people, their, their religion or their spirituality is based on, well, I don't do this and I don't do that. Okay? So these, these negatives aren't what makes a positive. It's good that we have some things that we refrain from doing, but what is manifesting in your life? What grace is being shown and produced in your life? So, uh, can, can anybody see the beautiful graces of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives? The fruit. Negative goodness is not enough in, in life. There must be positive qualities that come from us. So, here's the thing that's contrasted in the book of Galatians. Works and fruit. A machine in a factory works, and it turns out a product, but it could never manufacture fruit. And you know, that's something I've used for years. The Lord gave me that thought years ago, and it's just obviously right there. But I thought, man, that's what churches are doing sometimes. They're trying to just manufacture. They're just trying to, you know, you, you, this is, you got to look like this, talk like this. Everybody's got to be the same. And if you do that, you go through QA and yep, everything, everybody looks fine. You normally got somebody in the church, as I Wednesday, mentioned on Wednesday night, whether it's the pastor or whether it's old sister or brother better than you, whoever it is, but they're the ones that come around with a set of calipers and make sure that your specs are right. Right? Let me make sure your specs are right because we're producing 
Uh, but listen, uh, we're, we're manufacturing, I should say. But see, there's a contrast here. A factory, a machine can produce uh, or can, can manufacture works, if you will. It can make stuff, but you cannot manufacture fruit except the plastic kind. And by the way, I've seen some of that in my day too. It, it, see, some people, all they got, it's like, oh man, that, 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 the, you look very fruitful. And you go to grab it, you ever been to somebody's house and they got the plastic grapes? And they make them look realer than ever now. But they're still just fake. They're still just plastic, plastic bananas, plastic apples. They're no good. They're, they don't do any good. They look good. They don't go bad ever. Uh, but they're not really doing you any good. You say, what are you getting at? What I'm getting at is, is that is not what Christianity is supposed to be about. I am not trying to impress somebody else. Uh, you said, I thought it was about others. It is, but it's not about impressing others. It's about abiding in Christ and then being a blessing to others. Not by, you know, me trying to prove to you, hey, look at all my wonderful fruit. Fruit does not exist for other fruit. Fruit exists to be a blessing. And so, uh, so, so someone that is trusting in their works and that is basing their spirituality on their works alone, this is a person that's able to boast about the things that they're not guilty of. But, any, but, but that is in, in and of itself is not enough. Fruit must grow out of a life. And in the case of the child of God, it is the life of the Holy Spirit of God. When you think of works, you think of effort, labor, strain, toil. When you think of fruit, you think of beauty, quietness, the unfolding of life. The flesh produces dead works, but the Spirit produces living fruit. And this fruit has in it the seed for still more fruit. Love begets more love. Joy helps to produce more joy. Jesus is concerned that we produce fruit. More fruit and much fruit as we, we read in these verses. Because this is the way that we may glorify Him. This cannot be done through our flesh. Again, uh, it's, it's possible to counterfeit fruit. But flesh and works and effort on our own does not produce fruit, does not really see it come along. And I like that idea, by the way, of the seed of fruit. What's that mean? Seed can reproduce it. I mean, or fruit has the ability to reproduce itself because of the seed in it. This is such, a, I'm not spending a lot of time on this this morning, but man, you know what? As God's people, we need to be reproducing ourselves. Kurt was talking this morning about ways to, th things to do, things to get involved in to maybe help us get our eyes off of our own troubles and problems and complaints and stuff all the time. But you know what? Have you ever thought about trying to invest in others? Not only for others to be saved, that is vitally important, but you know one of the things that's lacking greatly in churches today, including ours to a certain extent, that I think starting with me, we could be so much better at? How much of our lives are we putting into somebody else's life to be a blessing? These people that have recently come to Christ, these new converts, how many of us are approaching them and saying, hey, can I have your number? I'd like to maybe have a Bible study with you sometime. I'd like to pray with you. I'd like to, maybe we could just go out for a meal. And, uh, but you're, you're trying to demonstrate and model, and you're just trying to reproduce. You're trying to keep your life going. I'm telling you, that's absolutely scriptural. It's a part of being the vine. And that starts with me. I'm not picking on you, but each of us, and, and thank God I know that there's many of you that do just that. And I think many of us do to some extent. But may God help us to put forth greater effort. I, I am here today as a result of the fruitfulness of somebody else's life. The fruitfulness of somebody else's life that, was, that, that affected me, that I was able to grow from the fruit that they produced. That's why I'm here today. P men that took time out of their weekends to spend time with me, to show me the Word of God, to teach me these things. And uh, what a blessing that is. And so there's the seed, that work that God, do, that, that God does, that, that God does. Um, <laughs> fruit grows. Uh, and, and the Bible says in the book of Galatians, and, and I'm going to turn over there and just read these verses here. Um, and again, just... I'm going to try to get as much of this to you as I can this morning, but uh, Galatians chapter number 5. 
And I want to start reading there in, uh, well, I want to start with verse 16, then I'm going to skip down. But verse 16 of Galatians 5 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I want to drop down to uh, verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not in the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time, time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit, so now we're talking about fruit, abiding in Christ, the fruit of the Spirit is, notice this, love. Isn't that wonderful? Love being produced in our lives. It's love. It is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another and envying one another. So here's the thing. I'll tell you one thing right now, that when it comes to the, 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 the vine, the branches don't envy each other. The branches do not envy each other. They're not mad at each other. This branch isn't mad that it's growing down here or over here. This, this, uh, br this branch and this cluster of grapes isn't upset that it's over here in the shade and nobody's noticing it. Why? Because as, as, as we grow, man, we ought to just mind our own business, in a sense. Now, you, well, you just said earlier that we need to be investing in other people's lives. We do. We do. But the thing is, is we ain't, we're not out here trying to put each other down. We're not out here trying to outdo each other. We're here trying to be a blessing one to another. The, listen, the, the, the branches off of this vine are all kinds of different shapes. They're producing different amounts of fruit. And they're, they're not checking each other out all the time. They're just growing. They're just connected with Christ, and this is what's coming out of them. And so, uh, and I, I believe, therefore, that since we grow, sometimes we may grow at different rates. There may be a Christian over here, man, that they're just, I mean, just doing incredible. There may be one of, one of us over here that's struggling, but the, and we, we want to help that one out. But the fact of the matter is, we're not around trying to outdo each other, put each other down. We're not around all the time trying to get credit for what we do. Because what we do is just abide in Him. And whatever it is that's coming from my life is just glory to God. It's not about me. It's not about me getting praise. It's not about me getting recognition. It's nice to try to do that. But the fact of the matter is we need to understand that we need to abide in Him. Stay connected with Him. And so, uh, in, in addition to that, we think about this fruit that we produce. And we just went through several there in the book of Galatians. But the idea is, is that this abiding relationship is natural to a branch and a vine. But it must be cultivated in the Christian life. Abiding in Christ. And by the way, the one thing I forgot to tell you when I was giving you those definitions of what it means to abide, uh, to stand, to stay, to continue, to dwell, and so forth. I forgot to tell you that the word minnow is a verb. It is a verb. So you say, what do we do? I know in a sense we don't do anything. We stay connected in Christ. But by staying connected to Christ, there is things that happen. There's a byproduct of that. Abiding in Christ means that we need to be faithful with our worship to the Lord. Our meditation on God's Word. Prayer, sacrifice, service. And this is what I'm saying for a Christian. You're connected with Him but if we're not cultivating these things in our lives, you're missing out. And what happens is that just as the world and those that do not know Christ have to go look for joy in all kinds of other things, drugs and alcohol and, and, and just an illicit lifestyle, they're looking for joy every which way they can. Thank God I'm glad that I found the secret, amen, years ago. I know that it's in Christ, amen. I know that true joy is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad I know that today. And so, uh, but, but here's the thing. There's many Christians that still don't get that. Yeah. Why? Because we are not taking the time to cultivate. Jesus, I mean, think about what Jesus said there in verse number 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you. 
and that your joy might be full. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord wants us to be a joyous people. He really does. And now, not, that doesn't mean that we always go through good times, but joy means that we can have a peace and an appreciation of God uh, even in the midst of difficult times. But He wants us to have joy. I, th I think that's wonderful. The Lord says, I want you to have joy. It reminds me of what He said earlier in John 10.10. 10. He said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I want your life to be overflowing, he says. I want your life just to be, I mean, yeah, somebody wrote a song years ago about, I want you to be drinking from your saucer because your cup is overflowed, you know. You've got, you've got so much more than you could ever need. You're so blessed. That's what God wants for you. Amen. But one thing about God, I'll tell you this, this is true in salvation, this is true in our service, that God is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit of God is a gentleman. Here's what I mean by that. He is not going to force you to make an effort in your Christian life. He's not going to force you to read your Bible. He's not going to force you to worship and, and look to Him and spend time with Him daily. He's not going to force you to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. He's not going to force any of us to do that. If you're here today and you do not know Christ as your Savior, He's not going to make you get saved. He gives you free will. He wants to save you. He's going to work on your heart. He's going to try to speak to you to show you that you need to know Him. That you don't know Him, but He wants to know you. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. But He will not force you. And it's the same thing with our lives. We have to make, and really, I say we have to make an effort, but what the Bible really says we need to do is just yield. We just need to let God have His way and say, Lord, here is my life. Uh, let it be yours. Let it be used for your good and for your glory. I was, I, on that topic, I was thinking about this. What do some of you think about verse number 7? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Do you know what the key is to getting what you want in prayer? Ralph? I know Ralph does. We've talked about this before. And this might sound like kind of cute, but I'm telling you there's a truth to it. Wanting what God wants. Amen. Wanting what God wants. Amen. Praying according to God's will. Amen. See, I thought about this yesterday. I didn't say it uh, during our men's uh, prayer meeting. By the way, I had a great uh, meeting, good turnout yesterday. But prayer, understand this about prayer. I'm just throwing this in there before I, because I don't think I'll get to this. But prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. But it's laying hold of God's willingness. That's how we act sometimes, like, oh, God don't want to really do it, but if I pray hard enough, maybe I'll change his mind. <laughs> no, he wants to do it. Well, depending, he wants to do his will, amen? Uh, but, it's, it, but he wants us to faithfully lay hold on that willingness. Uh, trust in him, depend on him, learn some things through that. I'll tell you something else that I'll not take the time to expound on, but notice what the Bible says there. In verse number 2, after saying that the father is the husbandman, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. But every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. One thing about being in the vine, being connected, is that there's purging. Uh, in, a, uh, in a vineyard, in some, especially when, go, when you go into the Middle East, they don't just hire somebody today and let them be out uh, pruning the vines the next day. It's oftentimes several years, a couple to three years of training before they'll allow somebody to be someone that can prune uh, the vine. Someone that's the husbandman, they know what they're doing. They know how much to cut. They know the proper angles to cut. And when they're pruning, they are looking for the things that are, are useless, the dead branches, the dead pieces of wood that are no longer uh, you know, being beneficial. But they also cut back some live things live parts of the vine, uh, so that it may produce more. In other words, God works in us to prune and take away the bad things. Take away the things that are not pleasing to Him. And I want to tell you about the things that aren't pleasing to God. The things that are not pleasing to God are uh, almost every time not good for us anyway. They're not a blessing to us anyway. We think they are. See, sometimes we so desperately want to hang on to our sin. I can remember uh, when I first got saved, one of, the th one of the messages I was often hear, I'd often hear reference to pet sins. Those sins that people love. 
Those sins that people protect. Those sins that they, they don't... You know, it's funny. A, a lot of times people like when a preacher gets up and preach against sin. Man, I like a preacher to just get up and preach against sin. You know what kind of sin people like preachers to preach against, though, don't you? Other people's sins. <laughs> Other people's sins. Not mine. Uh, there, you know, the preacher gets on my sin. Now he's going to meddling, you know. He's done quit preaching and got to meddling. Uh, but what we've got to understand is this. Some of those sins that we so desperately try to hold on to, that we try to excuse. We excuse our anger. We excuse our anxiety. We excuse it instead of confessing it. Whatever, whatever other sin that it might be that we're either trying to hide, protect, excuse, as if our life depends on it, what we don't realize, God's not going to... Well, as Kurt mentioned this morning, sometimes He will do some things to get your attention health-wise, perhaps, or in your life. Because He loves you, and He's trying to say, man, I want to bless you. I want you to find what real joy is. You're over here trying to find joy in something where there's not joy. I tell you, man, people can just be so stupid. And I'm a people, so I know wherever I speak. But the great I am, that I am, who's the I am? That's the, that's the one, that's the self-existent one. That's the omniscient God, the all-knowing God. That's the omnipotent God. That's the all-present God. I am, the I am, that I am is trying to speak to you today. And he says, I want to have an abiding relationship with you. I told you I, there was no way I could get to all this because you know what else he said? I want you to abide in me. But you know what else he said? Because I'm going to abide in you. Amen. Hallelujah. The great I am, God Almighty, says, I'm going to abide with you. I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to dwell with you. But he just says, hey, I want to work in you. And I am talking to you. People, I, I thank God for the times people leave this church and they say, man, preacher, it seems like he's talking to me today. Well, I was, amen. And I want to say something greater than that. Really, I'm not. The Holy Spirit of God is. Because he knows your heart, amen. Now, on the other side, there's been other people who says, man, I feel like he's preaching right to me. I'll tell you, uh, it's, it's so funny. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's funny, but it's not funny. But it is not uncommon. It is not uncommon for people to come to church. And I, I have known men that have left mad at their wives for my preaching. Because you know what they're sure of? She told him. I cannot believe that you told him. Guess what? She didn't tell me nothing. God told me. And by the way, God didn't tell me on you. But I just get up here and preach. I study. I pray. I preach God's Word. Hallelujah. Listen, I'm glad that I'm not looking at some denominational headquarters. I was, I was playing basketball at a, at a church on a Saturday several years ago. And the pastor was there. And man, he was so stressed out because his sermon hadn't come in yet for the week. I guess he got him in the mail or email or whatever, and he was there frantic. Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm glad I'm not looking at some denominational headquarters for my messages. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm looking to headquarters. Amen. Amen. My heavenly headquarters. And I'm telling you, it is God Almighty that speaks to your heart. And if you're under the sound of my voice right now, I can promise you on the authority of God's Word, on the authority of all that is holy and on all that is true, that the great I Am wants to have, desires to have, longs to have a relationship with you. If you are not saved, man, He wants to save you today. He may say, saved what? I can remember, I've shared with you before. I, I used to hear people talking about getting saved and I thought somebody drug them out from a burning car or something. And I, I remember years ago uh, speaking to a guy uh, that, that uh, fixed cars when I lived up in Pier and uh, uh, are you saved? And he says, oh yeah. He says, I've been saved. He says, matter of fact, he said, I've prayed for others and they've been saved. Some of you have heard this story. But I'm thinking, oh man, I never knew. I could have sworn this fellow needed the Lord. But I'm glad I pressed a little bit further. Well, tell me about it. He says, well, about 20 years ago, I was in a really bad wreck. You know, rescue squad came, drug me out. Man, I could have died, but I, but I was saved. 
And he said, and I've seen other, his, his, his shop was right out on the highway. I've seen other uh, accidents right here out on the highway and I've prayed and I've seen, and those people have lived. And that's wonderful. But when I will talk about being saved, I'm not talking about being saved and drug out from a burning car. I'm talking about being saved and drug out of a burning hell. Amen? Amen. And if some have compassion, making a difference. See, the Lord loves you if you're not saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ did not come shed His life's blood on the cross because getting baptized or sprinkled or poured on as an infant would get you to heaven. Jesus Christ did not come because the Baptist church could get you to heaven or the Lutheran church or the Catholic church or whatever else. Jesus Christ did not come because our good works and the best we can do and being sincere and everything else could get us to heaven. If that was the case, He would not have, He would not, he would not have needed to come. He came because the only way to save you and the only way for me to avoid the penalty of sin and death and hell was for Him to come pay it all. That's why He came. Because He wants a relationship with you. He's the great I Am. So if you're not saved, He wants a relationship with you. But what is our problem as God's people? How many of us are living a fruitful life? How many of us are living a joyful life? How many of us have that love, joy, peace, long-suffering, I mean, meekness, uh, temperance. How many of us are experiencing those things? Let me tell you something, child of God. The great I am wants to have this relationship with you. He wants to abide in you the way you abide in Him. He wants us, He wants each of us to have a victorious life. Amen. The Bible says we're more than conquerors through Him yes. and in Him. This, this is all around this message on the vine. That's what it's, it's the principles are there. And so, child of God, let God have His way. Yield to Him. Confess your sin as sin. Confess it as sin. Get it right with God. You say, man, I do not want to let go. You know, that's the problem with people. That's, the, that's one of the greatest reasons that people don't want to come to Christ. Because they love their sin too much. But one of the greatest reasons that God's people don't walk in more victory is sometimes they just love themselves too much. They think... If we really loved ourselves, we'd have the great I am, the all-wise God, and let him, just obey Him and let Him work in our lives. Hey, when I preached to you, so I, I remember years ago the preacher said, when I'm pointing a finger at you, there's three pointing back at me. I'm not preaching to you as some saint this morning. And if I was, Janelle's here and she could tell you I'm not. Amen? She works with me. Uh, so listen, I'm not, but what I'm saying is each of us, each of us, by the grace of God, need to, uh, if you're saved, man, let God have His way. 